What is your freedom worth to you? Each of our guests had a light bulb moment. They longed to live rather than merely exist. They smashed through their fears and programmed minds, trusting themselves, their faith and their survival instincts. Leaving the guilt, fear, oppression and drudgery of their past. For a brighter future. They took a brave and courageous step into Freedom. This is their story of how they got a life. Welcome to Get a Life Podcast, Excult Conversations. You matter and so does your story. Hey everyone, welcome back to Get a Life Podcast, Excult Conversations. We are back again with Steve sharing his personal story today. Welcome, Steve. And alongside, we have Abby today. Welcome, Abby. Thanks for joining us. So if you have not watched the Unispace podcast, um, I recommend that you do. So that's the podcast right before this. And today, Steve is going to get inside his personal story on how he was excommunicated and what led up to it. So I'm going to just jump right into this and hand it over to you, Steve. And yeah, go ahead. Okay, thanks, Cheryl. Well, uh, my name is Steve Simmons. I'm from Auckland in New Zealand. I, I I hate talking about myself, but I do think it's important that I share these experiences that I've been through, particularly in the last four years when I was since I was shut up, but really going back further than that too. So I. To give a bit of background, I lived in Auckland all my life. I was born in April 1960, so I'm 63, nearly 64. Got married in 82, it's 42 years ago. I've been in the PBCC all my life until I was shut up four years ago and then withdrawn from two years ago. They were both on the 22nd of February. And my father, Robert Simmons, he was always fully committed to the brethren position whatever the man of god's current teachings were he never questioned them even if he didn't understand them he and he was never prominent like his his older brother harold was quite well known yeah that's that's my dad and mum obviously earlier in their in their married life i'm not sure how old they were there my mother was always outwardly subject to my father and and she always supported him but inwardly, she was in a lot of soul t- turmoil all through their marriage. And she carried strong judgments about many things that were taught and practiced by the brethren. Craig Hoyle actually goes over it in his book, Excommunicated, which I think is very well written. Craig's mother is my first cousin. So it is a, a, when he refers to his um, aunt or something that's that's referring to my mother so i grew up accepting the current teaching as being right and believing that the elect vessel was so close to jesus that he couldn't say or do anything wrong some of what went on in mr simington's time didn't make any sense to me perhaps less so in john hales's time i think he generally acted according to scriptural principles as far as i could see but if there was anything that I couldn't rec- reconcile with basic scriptural teaching, I, I guess I just assumed that it, it was me that wasn't spiritual enough to understand. I realised quite early on that I wasn't cut out to be prominent. It wasn't really something I aspired after. I'm quite happy to stay in the background out of the limelight. And I'm, I'm looking back, I'm quite thankful for that because there's a lot of scope. Anyone in the Brethren who... Um, aspires after a bit of prominence or recognition it's it's not that hard to get it you you unfortunately you don't have to actually be a truly humble or especially committed person to be a leader in the brethren main qualifications seem to be that you if you're a male you're very wealthy you've got your own business and you're unreservedly loyal to bruce that's pretty much what qualifications are because most of them are also overweight. They've got a pretty wife and they're 
<laughs> love strong drink you know that seems to be so true that's the yeah and obviously it's good if you can you know if you know your bible and you can trot out the ministry from past and present leaders and take the reading and whatever that, that that's all you, you do need a bit of basic stuff like that but um i've sat through thousands of readings and preachings that are just completely empty and lifeless just going over the terms no real power and, and I, I just feel so sorry for the brethren what i've seen since i've come out i've listened to a lot of um, podcasts from preachers like um tim keller in new york and it's made me realize that there's so little real food in the meetings even bruce's meetings there's not really food in them he portrays himself or allows it to be portrayed that he's the personification of jesus and the holy spirit but as far as i'm concerned you can sit through a hundred of his meetings and never be really brought brought to know christ as your savior and of course in the brethren you're indoctr indoctrinated from birth to believe that you've been sovereignly chosen to be born into the most favored you know most enlightened special marked out people on earth the only ones that hold the lord's supper according to the scriptures and the ones the lord comes to first on a sunday morning and so on the only place where all the truth is held and most accurate accurate translation of the bible but as far as i can see it's not the truth it, i haven't joined any other churches personally since i was shut up but uh, i've as i said i've listened to hundreds of sermons preachings some of these men have got such a remarkable understanding of the bible of of divine persons and principles of christianity as i said the um the one i i really love listening to most is a guy called tim keller who died last year he's on um, spotify and youtube gospel and life I, I just love his his preachings but there's others too like men like john lennox and david martin lloyd jones c.s lewis and each of them has got their own very deep profound knowledge of god and, and they're able to put out the gospel in, in their own unique way and I, i've i can say that i've learned a lot more about the scriptures and the truth in the past four years than i did in the previous 60s mm -hmm. um also i've come across persons from all walks of life who'd, who'd put almost all of the brethren to shame with just with their simple faith and devotion committal one day not long after i was shut up there, there was an old married with a guitar down in, outside the grocery store near where i live <clears throat> his name was Peresi. he looked like a an old hobo he's probably pushing 70 i suppose and he had his guitar case open with a few coins in it i realized he was singing hymns and i so i thought oh, i'll ask him how he came to know jesus and and so i went and asked him and his face just lit up and he he just he was beaming all over his face he told me all about story about how he'd got converted in prison years ago and then he told me all about his life since his conversion he probably talked to me for half an hour and jesus obviously meant so much to him since his conversion that he'd devoted his entire life to bringing people to christ um he spoke about his experiences to to anyone and everyone and he'd um he'd brought hundreds of people to to know jesus crooks gang members drug addicts prostitutes he of, often had no money nowhere to sleep but um every time god provided for him sometimes in unexpected ways once he literally had no money to pay his rent he, he was had been renting a house i think it was winter he was kicked out because he couldn't pay the rent and um he was praying about it while he was praying there was a knock on the door and a man was standing there and he handed him a check for two thousand dollars and and he he told pressy that the lord had told him to go to that house and and give the, the man who opened the door to give him two thousand dollars <laughs> and 
you know, apparently we're not in the day of miracles, but but that to me is a like a miraculous story. And he was much better taught in the scriptures than I was. Uh, not that that's saying too much, but the the thing that really struck me about talking to him was the, the way his face was just shining uh, the way as he spoke about Jesus. You know, you could just see it bubbling out of him joy and peace and serenity and just total satisfaction. He, like he had nothing naturally, but he had everything in his heart. That, this was only a few months after I was shut up. And I'm ashamed to say that I I still had the sense that you have when you're in the brethren that you're a bit special. And so I, I sort of, when I went up and spoke to him, I thought that I might have been able to give him a word of encouragement, you know, or whatever. And instead, it came home to me that he was the one that was special and I, I was the one that needed the words of encouragement. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it, it was truly remarkable. But um, anyway, as I, I thought about it quite a bit over the next few days and weeks, and I, I thought, well, if the Lord Jesus came to came in person, came to Auckland, where, who would he seek out? You know, you'd think surely if you were in the brethren, you'd think, well, surely if Jesus came to Auckland, he'd, he'd come to, he'd stay with one of the brethren, surely, you know, um, obviously it wouldn't go without saying, but <laughs> would he, you know, he could stay with Peter Bishop or Brian Johnson or whoever. <laughs> They've all got very comfortable homes and good areas of the city that provide the very best of care for the Lord, obviously, give them the best food and drink, drive them around in a, in a nice limousine with security men and everything. But, and then I thought, no, I don't think so. I, I have a suspicion that if Jesus came to Auckland, he, he wouldn't, he'd just completely bypass the brethren and, and go instead to some of the worst parts of the city where there's crime and sin and so on. But people like Peresi there that are just totally devoted to to the Saviour, to the Lord, with hardly a penny of the, to their name, maybe no adoring followers, no reputation, nothing naturally attractive, but something that's just real. So uh, I thought about when Mr. Darby, I think, um, when he first left the Church of England, he, I think one of the reasons was that he re realised that if Paul had come he wouldn't be able to preach in any ch churches in the UK because he wasn't ordained. And I thought, well, th this man, this Percy, he's got a far greater love for Jesus than I've found anywhere in the Brethren. But if you go by Brethren teachings, I I I'd have to stay separate from him. I wouldn't be able to eat with him, couldn't take communion with him. But he's a, a genuine kind of man. So I, I thought there might be a wee bit of a parallel with that. And then then I, you, you take that character of man and then you contrast it with the character of the of prominent men and the brethren and you think, well, you know, they're not the same, are they? Inside you have a person with enormous amounts of money and success and, and everything else. You know, there's just no, no comparison. And, and then going along with it, inside you have this repeated cruelty and callousness um, towards people that driving hundreds or maybe thousands of people into destitution and despair and even suicide and husband and wife's breaking up and driving a wedge between parents and children and grandchildren and it, even on top of that, there's, there's criminal activity even and gross immorality yeah. covered up and deceit and lying and fraud, bribery and corruption. To go back to um, Peresi for just for a moment, he asked who I worshipped with. And, and of course, I'd recently been sh shut up. So, um, but at that time, I was, I was still expecting that the whole corrupt system would be exposed quite quickly and that I'd be reunited with my family and friends. So I, I just told him very briefly that I've been cut off for raising concerns about what I felt was corrupt dealings in the leadership of the group that I met with. And he, he just looked at me and he said, never let any man come between you and Christ 
Wow. And yeah, it came came home to me like a, a shaft. You know, I, I realized that he hit the nail right on the head. The, the teaching in the brethren is pretty much focused on ca- need to come to Jesus through Paul. Uh, um, and it's been main teaching pretty much for the, for my entire life. <laughs> but I believe that it's the main reason why the position has now got so far from true Christianity. Count millions of people around the world find Christ as their Saviour and Lord without ever having heard of Bruce Ailes. And does that mean that they're not real Christians? Of course not. <laughs> does it mean that their faith and their beliefs are flawed in some way? Of course it doesn't. You, Everyone has to find Christ personally, directly, in their own soul experiences. And letting, if you let Bruce or any other man or woman come between you and Christ, it's going gonna, it's gonna to interfere with you finding him as your perfect saviour, able to meet every, you know, every single need and desire that you might ever have. Just to quickly go back, I've, I've got six children, three boys and three girls, now aged between 28 and almost 41. The two eldest and the two youngest are still in the brethren, and the middle two are not. Some of you may know Lindy, who started the Olive Leaf Network about a year ago, and my son Braden, who's the one that Bruce Hales was talking about in the meeting in Sutton, was it back in 2014, I forget the year, he he said he should take rat poison. As far as I know, at the moment I've got 10 grandchildren, eight in the brethren, Lindy's got two. I kind of doubt that my wife or family would let, even let me know if any more came along. <clears throat> two two have been born at least since I was shut up, I've, who I've never seen, obviously. I've only seen one or two photos of them which sort of came through a back route. One of them so are you classed about... as an opposer? Oh, yeah, of course, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Join the yeah, club. One of the, wor- one of the <laughs> worst, yeah. Oh, dear. Uh, one, one of them lives about two kilometres from my workplace. But, um, you know, so about well, three weeks ago, I suppose, I asked my wife if she'd send me some recent photos of the grandchildren, but she hadn't even replied, which I take as a refusal. So it's it's been four years now since I've seen any of my Brethren, grandchildren, or grandchildren, except my youngest son continued working for me for a few weeks after I was shut up and then disappeared from my life. So I just live in a little cottage, which is over the back fence from our family home. I bought it about a year before I was shut up, actually, in view of providing for my mother in law. It was an absolute dump. <clears throat> when I got it, I seriously considered burning it down or just demolishing it it was so bad yeah so that's the house when i when i bought it but at the inside is actually much worse than the outside it was just a just a scrap heap inside and out so in the end i decided to get it renovated which started about the time i was shut up took several months i'd honestly never expected that i would live in it Oh wow! Oh wow! So that that's it um, now. It, that's I mean, it's clean and tidy. It's only small, but and this but, is right behind your family home, like where your family lives yep. now. They don't live there. Oh, okay. Uh, my wife doesn't live there either. About eight months after I was shut up, my wife asked me to move out of the family home. Um, this was about October twenty twenty. So I moved into this little cottage. I had a small amount of contact with Jackie while I was shut up before I was withdrawn from, but we've had almost no face-to-face contact since I was withdrawn from. And a few months after I'd moved out, she decided that she didn't, she couldn't live so close to me, just over the back fence. So she moved into her mother's home so it's been empty for the past two and a half years we're trying to sell it now oh that's beautiful that's the family home it's quite big 
we, we had six kids and, uh, you know, we used to entertain a lot. Not a very good photo, sorry, but in the last year or two, the market over here has plummeted. It's worth about 800000 less now than it was a couple of years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I, I've, I've got a small manufacturing business with 10 or 11 staff. Braden works for me, but none of the other staff had any connection with the brethren. I can honestly say that having the the business has been a, a lifesaver to me. It's given me a reason to get up in the morning, <clears throat> something to occupy my mind. I can I can scarcely think of anything any greater cruelty than to take a man's business from him uh, after you, you cut him off from his wife, his children, his grandchildren, his social life, every single support and legitimate source of comfort but and then take his business as well imagine i mean some of these people if it just no reason to get up in the morning nothing to channel your energy nothing to keep your mind productively occupied the brethren have done it to many just makes a mockery of their of what the pledge in the faith and practice document so the, the faith and practice document i don't know whether many of the brethren in, uh, inside even know that this document exists, but it, it's like a charter that was provided to the Charities Commission in the UK. Um, and it, it effectively forms the basis of the, the brethren being regarded as a charity. Anyway, section six and sub clause seven, it, it says, no action should be taken in any way to treat vindictively, maliciously or unfairly persons whether within or outside the community, including those who were within the community and who are leaving or have left the community. Every care should be taken to provide for and support the welfare and education of the children and young persons within the community. Where persons seek to leave the community, reasonable assistance should be afforded to them <clears throat> in terms of support and or financial assistance relating to employment or other matters where they have been dependent on the community for that support. Reasonable steps should be also taken in these cases consistent with and subject to any legal requirements applying to persons involved and the human rights of the persons involved to allow the continuation of family relationships where a family member has left the community, including providing access to family members, in particular children. <laughs> so this is in black and white. It, um, it was approved. It, it says in the um, in the document that it, <clears throat> that it was approved by the uh, the man of God. The, um, so Bruce Hales obviously had to do with with it, and uh, this is what was provided to the authorities. As this is the way that we act. <laughs> so, is that in New Zealand as well? Well, effectively, it's in the. It was done for the UK Charities Commission, but you know we've always been taught that there's there's one standard in, in the fellowship, haven't we? You know, you couldn't say that that applies to the UK, but it doesn't apply to New Zealand or Australia or wherever. Could you? I mean, I, I don't think. No, to me, no, that faith and practice document was for worldwide. It just came out of the UK Commission's report with what was yeah. going on at that time. To me, that was applicable to every fifty-five thousand plus members that are a part of the PPCC. No, I was yeah, just wondering so, uh, if it had actually been presented formally to any of the other governments in. No, I don't oh, think so. No. Um, and I, I think that, as far as I know, um, no no brethren outside the UK were even made aware of its existence. Um, you, you'd think like a, an important document like that, which is effectively like a charter, you'd think that it should be made available, should be printed like in a white book or something or other, given to all the all the members worldwide. And and so this is this is how we should act. But, I think yeah. in the UK at the time, we had this book called, um, this little pamphlet called Practicing Our Beliefs. Yes. And that sort of 
um, smoke screened that document. So even oh, most of the UK brethren didn't actually receive the faith in practice document. Really? I see. Yeah. Okay. And I want to let all the viewers and listeners though, in every podcast that goes out, this whole document, the faith and practice document is attached to the description of every podcast that we put out so that you can always have access to it. And I do. If you're inside, print it off, print it off yep. and have it just laying around. It should be in every household, exactly like Steve says, completely mm. accessible so that you're familiarizing yourself with it and knowing that what your rights are and the rights that those that leave the PBCC have. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty explicit. And you take cases like like Richard, um, yeah, for example, there's no possible connection with what they claim and, and the way they treated Richard. And or, he's from the UK. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's just, just a farce. If Bruce suspects that someone, anyone might, might be a little bit of a threat to his place or his power or his control, the... Um, the machinery gets put into action to suppress that threat or eliminate it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's somehow the threat is portrayed as opposition to the testimony or to God's sovereignty or something or other. And and then the brethren are persuaded that it, you know, it's serious and it needs to be dealt with severely, which. But did they yeah, come off the um, business? That 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 going, they're trying to. Um, but yeah, I'll cover that in a, a little bit later on. Yeah, of course. Cool. Um, but it's all right. The, the, um, and, and often that what happens after you've been excommunicated is almost worse than the treatment before. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like so many cases, the, the wife's persuaded that she has to get a separation mm. from this wicked person and, and engage a the top lawyer of the king's council if possible and you know go for two-thirds of the joint asset you know whether or not she needs all that money to live comfortably for the rest of her life doesn't it's not a not a consideration you know children are turned against their father and or, or mother in some cases and then quite often the the, the business man loses control of his business sometimes through sort of shady means or even illegal means and if they can find any any uh, basis for taking legal action against the person who's been excommunicated they they'll do that after anyone that's been excommunicated makes makes the smallest misstep or or anything then stories get they, they just go through the Brethren community like wildfire that so and so is corrupt or mental or alcoholic or an addict or whatever, and uh, you know they they totally lose their credibility and mm -hmm. and their some manage to hold on to their sanity, but you know others it, it's just more than they can yeah. can take, which I I find so heartbreaking. You know, good persons are. You've been just driven into destitution and despair, and you know nothing left in life to to live for. Almost, it's kind of happening to me right at the moment, except that I'm not being driven into into despair. Um, but it's obvious that Bruce is trying to crush me, yeah, and destroy my business and credibility and everything. Do what he's done to so many others. It just it, like get them to the point of desperation where they do something foolish or immoral or whatever. I can't think of any reason why true Christians would ever engage private detectives to shadow people to track their movements and hack into their computers and email accounts and phones and all that. Do everything they can to find dirt on people they regard as a threat. Even in some cases, if they can't find it, they make it up. Spread yeah. false rumours around inside the brethren community, which then leaks out into the wider community. Now, I know someone in New South Wales that Bruce seemed to view as a bit of a threat to his authority. This is going back oh, quite a few years now, 15, 16 years, I suppose. 
and he was withdrawn from on a false charge without it. the reason apparently that he was withdrawn from he was it was never raised with him by any priest or elder hmm. um and and yet they claim that he was withdrawn from for xyz but they never ever spoke to him about xyz before withdrawing from him and then after he was withdrawn from false reports were spread around which utterly they just destroyed his life as in his reputation then his business was taken from him and you know it's just a it's one of the most horrific miscarriages of judgment that i that i know of it makes me just so angry and going back to to my business again briefly there's a, a prominent guy in melbourne called richard garrett with his sons daniel and bradley who, who work for him they've got a materials handling business called sitecraft we manufacture materials handling um, equipment and they were our number one agent for about 10 years they sold millions of dollars of our equipment knew every detail about the machines and the customers and the marketing and so on just before i shut up they uh, they bought uh, about twenty thousand dollars worth of spare parts and then they abruptly stopped selling our products and then Lo and behold, about a year later, they started selling their own copy of our machines. Wow. <laughs> Even they, they copied some of some unique design features of our machines. One of which was it had even a, a registered design in Australia, and they, um, they they didn't bother writing their own user handbooks or manuals or anything else. They just took ours, which they had copies of, of course. They just did a find and replace, put the name of their machine in instead of ours and handed them out to their customers. We know that because more than one of their customers sent us copies of their handbooks. That's disgusting. Um, uh, oh, yeah, it's illegal, but yeah. it, it, it's just contemptible for brethren to act in that way. I, yeah, I'll write to think Richard. it's okay. And they oh, think it's okay with it, so... In their mind, they're like, why not? It makes our job easier. Yeah, well, exactly, yeah. So I wrote to Richard, sent him an email, but um, and we, we actually engaged a lawyer and um, to look into it. We didn't actually take it through, but there was a bit of communication between lawyers. But Richard's attitude, like this is a, he's probably around 60, I suppose, that region. Um, and, and he's prominent in Melbourne and he's, he's, he takes fellowship meetings and everything else, but as, as far as I'm concerned, his at attitude was just pathetic and childish. He wouldn't even accept responsibility for, for them sending out word-for-word -word copies of our documents to the customers. He tried to, tried to claim it was unauthorised and he didn't know anything about it and whatever, whatever. But, like, it's his business. Uh, uh, he, he should take responsibility. Anyway, that's just a bit of an aside. I think it should be obvious to anyone to any any thinking person that there's many matters that bruce is desperate to keep hidden to keep in the dark in my view he's he's the same similar character to many of the notorious dictators in the world yeah. today with enormous wealth and power no conscience they'll happily destroy the lives of anyone they regard as a threat to their position and lifestyle and power. Like if Bruce was practicing the truth, why would you have to spend millions of dollars on lawsuits against people like Richard, for example, or, or Braden, or harmless old men like Peter Harrison and Palmerston North? He, he's died now, but he, he was relentlessly pursued by the UBT a couple of years ago. He, he had no money to defend himself. And of course, they had unlimited resources, um, so they just force them into a corner, force them to not, you know, tie them up so they can't say or do anything that they might that might harm the brethren. Not that he wanted to anyway. But as far as I'm concerned, it's just inhumane. I think the brethren just have to give in the care meeting. I think they they're just giving millions of dollars every year to a fighting fund, which is used to suppress opposers or so-called opposers i mean some of us are, re are viewed as opposers but not not opposed to 
Christian principles to, you know, not not opposed to the truth, opposed to what's wrong. But yeah. Yeah. there's millions of dollars are, are being paid into this fighting fund. And just recently you know, that fund was up. So that was, I'm trying to think of how many months ago that was, but yeah, we had gotten word from an insider that that, they had to give more to that fund, so it was really more than yeah. So it had their their allotted amount had been raised. <laughs> I see. Wow. There's more to fight these days, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. As far as I'm concerned, a, a Christian should have nothing to fear from the truth coming into the light. I think exactly. In, in John three, um, should welcome it because it sh shows to mankind that. His works have been wrought in God. It's what it says in John three, I think, verse twenty or twenty one. And I like I've said this before to many people. Right, this mess could be cleaned up very easily, and Bruce would actually get respect for it. Right, if he just sat of down course. and laid all the issues on the table and dealt with them one by one, like a true Christian should. Right. Or a yep. pastor. Right. They would sit mm. down and be like, OK, so let's take it. Let's look at this. This case. Let's look at this case. Let's look at this case. OK, so the police need to be called in here. We need to do this and get all the allocated people involved to help these situations. To me, that call would be restored as a mainstream Christian church. And Bruce would have a lot of respect. And it is yeah. like. We know he listens to all these or his minions listen to them and then relay it. I mean, mm -hmm. I just reiterate it again, that the more that you, he resists is the more that messier that this is going to get. So for those that fear the mess that's going to happen, Bruce is the one that is causing this mess to get messier and more chaotic because he keeps on resisting the change that needs to happen. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I think he's um, fearful of uh, accountability and responsibility for everything that's happened on his watch. Though I don't, I don't think he can take the the calm down and the ego smash yeah. that he would have if yeah. he did that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, again, being a man of God, and he's getting his direct word the way mm. that he says he's getting it. <laughs> to me, that that's, it should just be an automatic response of his, right? Or of if he passes away and those that take over, that should be an automatic, mm. compassion should be your automatic response, right? Of course. For me, that's mm. what it is. It's an automatic response of like, how can I help the situation? How can we help mm. the situation? What needs to happen, right? Like, I mean, yes, this stuff happens all over in the world, but we're talking yeah. about something, an institution that considers itself a mainstream Christian church has charity status. Mm and has 55,000 plus members that it's that are following it, compassion should be at the forefront. And those actions should show to whether you are a part of their community or outside of their community or somebody who has left the community. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think Bruce Hell should ask himself, what would Jesus do? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But I think his um, messages that he thinks comes from Jesus are from a different Jesus than what yeah. true Christians get their messages from, or that, you know, mm. like it's just. Maybe he's schizophrenic. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we digress there. Anyway, um, <laughs> when Braden was withdrawn from in 2019, the two brothers that were handling his matter, that uh, they asked me to go. Um, the day before they went over they went over the what they were planning to do which had obviously come from bruce hales and um and they asked me if i'd say something in the assembly meeting to agree with the action <clears throat> and, and your and own I son just, oh, my own son yeah i just i said to them i i i would not i i told them i i didn't agree with his withdrawal um, I, so you know, I, I openly disagreed with the action, even though I knew it was it had come from Bruce. And so I just didn't even go out to the meeting when he was withdrawn from. And uh, from that time on, I I started raising my concerns about Bruce with several responsible people in Auckland. And obviously, it all got relayed back. He was getting worried that some of it would 
come out into the light and, you know, made them pretty angry, obviously. Like, for example, over the Learning Centre scam, he he told Peter Bishop and Brian Johnson that, that he'd had absolutely nothing to do with it, which they relayed back to me. But, like, it, it's just simply untrue. It's it's false. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, I had evidence that, that he had, had been closely involved with it. So... And I, I was I raised a number of other matters at the same time, including the way that Richard had Marsh had been so cruelly mistreated. As far as I could see, he should have been commended for what what he did by exposing yeah. that that thing, but instead got condemned. There was three priests that that served me in the end, and that they sort of were a bit gentle with me, and they were trying to just talk me around and persuade me to not uh, ripple the on too much and and so on and you know that there was ex explanations for everything that i'd raised and th their attitude became increasingly threatening as time went by this was over the space of about eight months so it, it got more and more threatening about a week before i was shut up i was called to a meeting and and essentially they the three brothers individually they basically threatened me that there was there was a, an explicit threat that if I didn't accept that Bruce had done nothing wrong, I, I'd have to be shut up. Um, I didn't accept it, and, and here I am. <laughs> but okay. it, <laughs> these guys, the three brothers, that I, I like them. You know, they're, they're decent people. And even I went and spoke to my uncle, Harold Simmons, about my concerns. This is only a few days before I was shut up. And he'd been the leader in Auckland for, for a long time under John Hales. But it, it just totally spineless. If it's Mr. Hales, it's the it's divine sovereignty. You, you just you never prosper if you get up against divine sovereignty. So just accept that, leave it there, you know. I'd just love to appeal to anyone that's in the brethren, especially responsible persons in in Sydney, if any of them get to see this like persons like john know. anderson and phil mcnaughton and charlie baker there's a few others i don't know who's still in fellowship even in sydney these days but if you do watch this please don't dismiss it as someone with a grievance or an axe to grind because that's not why i'm speaking but if you really believe that bruce hales is the personification of christ and the holy spirit well you you cannot have had a real experience with Jesus as I have because there's an enormous gulf between them. A couple of scriptures, passages of scripture I'd quite like to draw attention to when I referred to earlier. John's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 19 to 21. And this is the judgment that light has come into the world and men have loved darkness rather than light for their works were evil. For every, everyone that does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, that his works may not be shown as they are. But he that practices the truth comes to the light, that his works may be manifested, that they have been wrought in God. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 to 10, But piety with contentment is great gain. <clears throat> For we've brought nothing into the world it's manifest that we that neither can we carry anything out but having sustenance and covering we'll be content with these but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and many unwise and hurtful lusts which plunge men into destruction and ruin for the love of money is the root of every evil which some having aspired after have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows so literally sums the brethren up in like two scriptures well, yeah uh, is that the same light in the first scripture as what they say that we've turned our backs on yeah. well it's it's in black and white you know so in the face of that scripture why would you anything a, a, a christian's life should be an open book that used to be said in them in the uh, in the brethren should be an open book you should uh, other people should be free to look at any aspect of your life at any time so if it is well 
let's have a look at some of these think matters that I've raised. For example, mm. the reaction I got to all the matters I raised was just, you know, don't go there, you know, mm. shut that book. There's a couple of other matters I'd quite like to t touch on briefly. I could go on for hours actually with about <laughs> criminal criminal actions and, and unspeakable cruelty and fraud and deceit done by responsible persons in the Brethren. But I just want to shine the light on a few matters in the hope that, that it will arouse some exercise and at least a few people still inside. So firstly, I think it should be obvious to anyone that examining the facts that there's no, there was no scriptural or moral basis for my withdrawal. I just want to make, make it clear that I'm not looking for sympathy in actual fact. Uh, if you understand what I'm saying, I, I'm actually thankful to have been withdrawn from, just from the point of view that it's opened my eyes much clearer to to the true position and and to my relationship with with Christ has been become a lot stronger since I was withdrawn from. Yeah, but, but it's important to point out the facts. Yeah. Yeah. So you got withdrawn from uh, and you came into the light, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> so after the Tuesday night meeting, when I was withdrawn from, um, Peter Bishop and Brian J Johnson, that's the two brothers that were serving me, they rang up, rang me up to tell me, and the only the reason they gave me on the phone was that I'd asked to be withdrawn from, <laughs> and and they'd taken me up on my request, and like I, I was just gobsmacked, um, but. By that, and I, I, I tried to protest, and I, I said, "When did I ask to be withdrawn from?" And and Peter just said, "Look in your emails," and then he hung up. So I, I went straight away and I searched back through my emails for the past year or so. I couldn't find anything that could be possibly taken as as asking to be withdrawn from. So I emailed them and I said, "Can you please explain?" And they replied saying it was about two years previous. So I looked back earlier. And sure enough, there, there was an email just about two months after I was shut up. I, I've been starting to feel quite depressed because, you know, the the reality of it was all starting to hit home. And and I like I knew down inside that I hadn't done anything wrong. Uh, I, I'd only been trying to get what I regarded as as wicked exposed. In my despair, I'd send an email to the priest and I said something like, you might as well withdraw from me and be done with it. So apparently they, they'd brought that up nearly two years later and and used that as a basis to, to withdraw from me. And so I emailed them back and I, I said, I was kind of protested. I said, look, you know, I was under enormous pressure at the time and I, I hadn't intended to ask to be withdrawn from. So the next morning, Brian, I got a call from Brian and, he told me that the reason for my, with, for my withdrawal wasn't actually that I'd asked to be. Uh, after all, that, that wasn't the reason. The real reason was that they had to withdraw from iniquity. <clears throat> so, uh, so I said, well, what's the iniquity that you're withdrawing from? I, I said, I'm not going on with iniquity. Uh, um, I, I was trying to expose iniquity. So, how can you say that you're trying to that you need to withdraw from me to? withdraw from iniquity you know he he was trying to uh, duck and dive and whatever and fumbling and mumbling and of course he couldn't explain what the iniquity was because there wasn't any and finally he, he said look uh, steve i can't continue talking to you because you're being contentious which is like referring to some scripture that contend not with a or something i don't know which is code um, which word is, that you weren't being submissive and yeah, do exactly yeah. as they said, no matter what yeah, it was. If they, yeah, if they feel like they're being forced into a corner, then they just say, oh, you're being contentious. I can't can't keep speaking to you. It's just childish. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, so I, I wrote to them again a couple of days later and I asked for a face-to-face -face meeting. And on Monday night, this is six days after I was withdrawn from, I just got home from work and my phone rang and it was Peter Bishop and he was wanting to explain the reasons for my withdrawal over the phone. And I, I said, I said, no, I'd asked for a face-to-face -face meeting 
And he said, oh, we're not prepared to do that at the moment. Because <laughs> so, they were all only acting under direction from Sydney. But so, so then he proceeded to tell me that the actual basis for, for my withdrawal was not, I, it was neither that I'd asked to be, nor that I'd been going on with iniquity, but the, the real reason was that I'd questioned assembly, assembly judgments in other localities and had refused to accept witness. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I'd been given three different reasons over the space of six days. It was obvious that Peter and Brian were both, like, way out of their depth. Uh, um, I, I think Bruce was too. And yeah. All they could do was, like, throw throw a lot of mud um, and hope that some would would stick enough to carry the consciences of the brethren and make make me look like an opposer and so they basically left with no option but to cut me off and that they weren't going by scriptural principles i'm fairly sure that many of the local brethren would have been quite uneasy about it i think the local brethren would would know that i i'm not an opposer but if any of them had raised any question or concern publicly or even privately it could have resulted in them coming under the same judgment yeah. and to me it's clear that I, I was just being made an example of so that basically all any member of the brethren knew that if you got up against bruce you'd basically you'd be just you'd dealt with without mercy were you which, actually against him personally though or were you against, against bruce his dealings oh, no, not at all no, I, I said that I, I told that to them time and time again. I said, I'm not against any person. All I'm asking for is is for these matters to be reviewed properly. And there's quite a, there's a massive difference between being opposed to a person and be, um, or against a person and being wanting matters to be looked at, which is all I was asking for. And it, it's, it's an important point. These days, in the PBCC, you, you get excommunicated for being opposed to Bruce Hales, not for being opposed to the Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. it, it's essentially it's become the Church of Bruce. Um, One hundred percent. Yeah. Know, if, if you blaspheme his name or speak against him, then you're not fit for for being in fellowship. Oh, to I me, that's it's totally wrong. Uh, yeah. Or if you go up against something that you've witnessed that was wrong or you're trying to bring it to light. I mean, the same thing happened to somebody that was trying to address what was going on in Maple Creek just recently, right? Like someone tried yeah. to address it and completely booted out. So really, it is, they just don't want to look at the stuff that has come to light. I mean, we're into podcast number 92, 93, something like that. Yep. Anybody who I've talked to, Nobody has come to them and said, hey, what's going on here? Can we sit down? Let's nobody's really? contacted me. Nobody's contacted no. me. It's just so utterly hypocritical and non-Christian yeah. the way that they deal with life within there. And I'm not saying that this stuff doesn't happen everywhere. It happens everywhere. But that's why we have legalities in place. That's why there's a system in place to help this kind of situation. Calling the police is not a bad thing. Let's get these people help. I have said that. I don't even care if my perpetrator gets cuffs and handcuffs on him. I don't care about that. I want, I know of his illness. I, I had his illness all over me for how many years? He needs help, right? So mm -hmm. I guess my biggest thing after just everything that you've explained here is that it is, it's easier for them to just take out anybody mm -hmm. who is up against exposing or trying to fix an issue that is in there right yeah and yep. what is happening is that it's just folding in on itself at this point right mm. people uh, are seeing yeah. through this yeah it's just heart-wrenching absolutely heart-wrenching it is it, it's heart-wrenching but I, i'm i'm shocked by what you say that so many of the of these matters that have come out in your podcast you'd think the first thing that the brethren should do is go and contact these people and say, look, you know, it, what your story is just is really, really heartbreaking. And, and I'm so, so sorry that, that, that it came to that. Yeah. And what can we do to put it right? If Nothing. what you say that, that it's never happened, that that's, that's even, yeah, it's really sad. 
And I mean, to me, it's not justice can come in many forms, right? So I don't hold my breath on, you know, having these people locked up in jail, right? Like, no. I, I don't, I mean, that's just a route I went because it was a route that led a paper trail. It was important to do. It's there. Um, but I don't hold my breath on it because I know no. justice comes in many, many, many forms. And we yeah. are having more success with what we're doing here than yep. any of us could have ever imagined. I mean, yeah. after we had recorded your podcast on Unispace and went for a walk, I just sobbed. I sobbed, but happy but tears. Then. Happy tears mm -hmm. in the sense that none of us could have ever dreamt of us all coming together like this in all mm. different walks of life. We've all wear different bruises. We all bleed differently. We all have different walks of faith, but yet we're all coming together for one mm. goal in mind. And that is yep. to have accountability within the PBCC. Yep. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. That's really good. Yeah. Yeah. If you could leave the brethren without having your life destroyed, that'd be one thing, but like if you were unhappy with... I don't think there'd be anyone left the, in the, there right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. There's going to be a lot of people that'll be like a, a ship without a rudder for a long time. Um, they they just pinned everything on, on what's come from Bruce uh, to the point where they can't even... that they, They're kind of left with no personal ability to to work out right from wrong almost you know if bruce says it's right or it's wrong well that's what you go by there's a, a lot of people that have just forgotten or never learned how to exercise their own judgment i think and and so when it comes you know when it all does come down there's going to be a lot of people that are just like totally lost i think a lot of brethren obviously the the price of leaving is just too high thought of losing losing all your contact with your family and your friends and your your children and your grandchildren and your siblings and and possibly losing your your job or your business and starting a, a new life outside it, it's just too daunting and of course bruce is he's very good at purchasing loyalty to from anyone he thinks is useful maybe useful or influential he can make make you feel special you know give you a little bit of prominence or money or whatever just to feel that you're tied in peter bishop i think he's a fairly prime example he's got a he's got a beautiful building in a prominent location in in auckland yeah there it is it's it's a really nice building right beside the motorway you know it's very high visibility well, a whole floor of that is rented by UBT, and another whole floor is rented by the the National New Zealand National School, and a whole bunch of other brethren businesses from out of Auckland rent office space there. Doesn't really shout humbleness to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know how much you'd be getting from from the brethren and rent every year, but hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know. Could be close to a million. I, I've got no idea. No idea. He can't afford not to be 100% loyal to Bruce because all it would take is one word from, from Bruce and, and uh, like UBT would get out and the school would get out and the brethren would all leave him. He'd be left with no tenants. Yeah, he really buys his his people. He buys his members 100%. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, going back to the faith and practice charter given to the UK's commission, um, it's very explicit about the the basis for excommunication. So again, in section six, which, which has got a subtitle of compassion, mm -hmm. um, uh, interestingly, in clause six, it says <laughs> Does it the really? final stage. Yeah, that's uh, section six, compassion, um, oh, and this okay. is a subclause of that. The, the final stage of assembly admonition would be excommunication. This being necessary when a person leaves and separates themselves from the assembly entirely on their own personal decision and accord, in which case their position as a member of the assembly becomes untenable. And in other rare cases, rare cases where the, where excommunication is necessary, as an extreme or last resort measure, 
for serious misdeeds, wholly at odds with basic scriptural teaching. Even in cases of excommunication, there is follow-up pastoral and shepherd care in view of the possibility of re-including the person concerned in fellowship and the restoration of him or her to full privileges as a member of the assembly, if he or she wishes. Now, I didn't leave on my own decision on the court, and the only other basis given is rare cases where it's necessary as an extreme or last resort measure for serious misdeeds wholly at odds with basic scriptural teaching. Well, explain. Because I would interpret that serious misdeeds as, you know, there, there could be some criminal activity or whatever that obviously is at odds with basic scriptural teaching. To me, this would apply to somebody who they have been caught um, having sexual abuse, like someone who's done yeah, yeah. abuse, someone who's a, been a pedophile. That to me, yep. that's what that should apply to. Not somebody exactly. who is bringing up um, criminal activity that is happening to try and preserve mm. the integrity of the community. That's yeah, exactly. And over against that statement, I was looking up some ministry from John Hales this morning for something else. And I looked up about assembly discipline and um, I know this is John Hales rather than Bruce Hales, but they still stand by oh, yeah. John Hales. They still stand by freaking J&D like over 100 years ago. Um, so I think it still matters what he says because Bruce Hales' ministry is basically a photocopy with a bit more money in of, um, of um, a few his more father. feathers. Yeah, um, but it says, it's very solemn because scripture speaks about persons having to be taught by discipline. We don't want that. It has to be, alas, and it pains us. Our whole beings are in pain when we have to resort to discipline to teach somebody something. Mm. So that's one reason why they put someone under assembly discipline, to teach mm. them something. And the second one mm. um it's a serious matter if somebody goes to the point where they have to come under assembly discipline. So then you can't express your love. The Lord has to appear that way in Revelation and he puts a scripture scripture to it. Sorry, um, It's Revelation 1 verse 13. Girt about the breast with a golden girdle. So that's why we only resort to it when there's nothing else that we can do. We look for yeah. every possible avenue of avoiding executive action of that kind. And when there's nothing else we can do, we have to resort to it. But even then, it's recovery that's in mind. Yeah. That's interesting, yeah. The brothers would say that tried and tried and tried. Like, as I said, it was it was over a period of eight months or so that they were trying to talk me around, if you like. So they'd probably say, well, we did, you know, it was a last resort. But... What about yeah, but it was a last resort mistake, to holy. try and get you to submit, though, right? Mm. It wasn't a last resort for you guys to come to terms on what you're trying to deal with. It was a last resort because you wouldn't submit to them. Yeah, uh, and serious misdeeds, wholly at odds with basic scr scriptural teaching. That's you know, so uh, yes, if there was a if there was a pedophile or, or a molester or something or other, and they that worked with him and worked with him to try and get him to come to a judgment of it and he, and he kept carried on with it well yes that's clear one of the reasons i was withdrawn from was was refusal to accept witness well in my mind the witness was false witness there was witness given that such and such had, had you know had, had happened or or whatever so and so was guilty of of this the, those assurances contradicted the facts um so therefore they're false witness so the, the witness that i refused to accept was false witness <laughs> and i think the i think there's a scripture that i can't remember where it is now but um we're not called to accept false witness yeah exactly um, and, and you, it's not a basis for being drawn from if you if you don't accept false witness yeah so i can't understand how they could possibly shoehorn me into that category so I've, I've written to brothers several times, actually, to ask 
ask them to say whether they whether they still believe what that faith and practice document says or whether it was just a big whitewash to trick the Ch Charities Commission into reinstating the charitable status. I think I even emailed Dean Hales once, um, but not one of them has ever replied. Yeah, of and as for the follow-up pastoral care and shepherd care, well, you know, that's non-existent. Uh, that, we've not been contacted once since we were withdrawn from either. Not that I want to be uh, at all. No, I see. <laughs> really? But, that's shocking, though. I, I, yeah. they, the, the brothers did um, email me once a few months after I shut up to ask if I'd like to um, like them to come and visit me. And I, I replied and I said, if you, just, if you want me to... Um, if you want to come and see me to try and persuade me that black is white, up is down, wrong is right, um, well, you, you're wasting your time and mine to come and see me. That's about all I said. But um, And then a, a little bit later on, I, I said something to them about never having followed up on me. And they, oh, you know, we tried to follow up on you and you, you refused <laughs> to see us. <laughs> well, uh, I didn't refuse to see you. I just said... You know, if you're wanting to tell me that, you know, that the opposite, this is wrong is right and right is wrong, well, you're wasting your time and mine. And they, they didn't, never came to see me. So. <laughs> so I assume that that's what they were wanting to do. So, you know. No, I think you're quite stubborn. And so they'll, um, <laughs> I think they're. Yeah, my wife's often told me that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that they're, um, tactics just don't work with you and that's why they probably yeah. just washed their hands of you yeah uh, yes yeah, so i've actually written to my to the brothers and even to my family um and i've stated quite clearly in writing i believe that the core the core doctrine which is also part of that faith and pra practice document submitted to the charities commission that i believe that they're scripturally scripturally sound and i've Ask them, are you prepared to to put your name in writing to say that you believe they're they're, they're true and and right? The only reply I had was from my wife, who wrote back something to the effect that it was produced. That document was produced to meet a specific need for a specific area, like the UK, at a specific time. So, essentially, oh, right. what she was, what I took out of that, I, she must have talked to. Peter and Brian about it. I don't know what I took it out of that was that it didn't apply. Now it was because the the brethren wanted their charitable status back. They they produced the document. It served its purpose. Doesn't apply now. It, oh, she hit yeah. the nail on the head, didn't she? To be fair <laughs> yeah. to her, I mean, <laughs> because they obviously they don't want to lose the the charitable status because that would mean. They could mm -hmm. lose millions of dollars a year, which would be, you know, that we couldn't possibly have that. So, but you'd you'd think that Christians should be clear and unambiguous in the in stating what they believe and and acting acting according to what they've said. Uh, say something and then do it. But um, they're just like sort of politicians, really. They s say what's appropriate at a certain in time or depending on on who it's to and and so on and then prime example of that is something that happened last year 24th of march last year i got a letter from peter peter and brian peter bishop and brian johnson which contained the following statements relating to reasons for my withdrawal you were withdrawn from for challenging and refusing to accept as right assembly judgments and other places and a refusal to accept wit witness. This was and is true, and is further evidenced by your refusal to disassociate from Braden. You clearly don't accept the way brethren apply assembly discipline. I'd like to emphasize that last sentence. Um, you clearly don't accept the way the brethren apply assembly discipline. And that they also wrote, you know, we have held for years that separation should be moral, physical, and legal. And then about a week after that, on the 30th of March, an article was published in, in the uh, media in New Zealand, quoting Doug Watt, 
who's the he's from Christchurch, he's the New Zealand media spoke, spokesman for the PVCC. He said, if a person leaves our church, it's up to them and their family to choose what their relationship looks like going forward. Oh, that's it is bullshit. certainly certainly not standard church practice to interfere in this decision. Um, yeah, so I've pulled so it up is, here, and okay, I'll attach so the link to this article. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it says right here, from time to time, a person will decide to leave our church. This is rare, and it is sad, and when it does occur, we wish the person well. Again, I mean, it, <laughs> some of their spokesmen... <laughs> People that say what they say, it's just absolutely ludicrous what they say. And here is the quote, the statement that Steve just read. If a person leaves our church, it is up to them and their family to choose what their relationship looks like going forward. It is certainly not standard church practice to interfere in this decision. The letter from Peter and Brian a week before was a a blatant contradiction to what appeared in the press. Um, So they told me, in writing, I didn't accept the way the Brethren applied assembly discipline, but the the spokesman says that it's up to the family, to them and their family, to choose what the relationship looks like, and the church doesn't interfere in this decision. Well, you know, it's it's just a blatant lie, uh, what Doug told the the press. I don't know how he sleeps at night um, sometimes after you know, putting out such nonsense. So I wrote to them and I. I pointed out it was contradictory and false and I asked which which version is true but they didn't reply of course I <laughs> which, love how it you keep me, going like, at they, them they, and looking <laughs> for accountability well, they must really hate you <laughs> yeah. yeah I know I'm a little bit of a thorn I think in the side probably but but I, I'm baffled as to how grown men can li- lie in public and, and still claim to be Christians yeah. Um, but the only explanation I can think of is that Bruce Hales said something recently, I think it's in the in the white book, something to the effect that the use of deceit is completely justified, yeah. mm-hmm. which there was in reference to persons that he regard as opposers. And so I assume it mean that that means it's okay to deceive and lie if it's to protect the testimony from opposers. Even if the opposers are not opposed to Christianity, but just to the blatant corruption that's in the hierarchy. And a couple of years earlier, there'd been an article published about the way private investigators have been following various ex-brethren in New Zealand, uh, New Zealand, including Braden and Lindy, my my children, and and um, which had obviously been set on and paid for by someone in the brethren, if not by UBT, and. There's so many scriptures about deceit, though. 1 Peter 2 mm. speaks about ridding yourselves of all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, yeah. and slander of every kind. So where does that align with what Bruce Hells has brought out in ministry? Mm. <laughs> Isn't it a ten, in, in, a, mm. in a Ten Commandment as well about deceit? Or is that no, very I'm false don't, witness? I don't... Yeah, bearing false witnesses. Yeah, I don't think it is about deceit. So the reporter asked Doug Watt for his comments so that they could present, you know, a balance. And Doug said, while we cannot comment on the actions of every individual within our church, it's certainly true to say that the church leadership has absolutely no knowledge or involvement in the matters you've described. And he went on to say, just like any church, we're sad if someone leaves us, but we wish them all the best in their lives. We strive to live a community-minded life following the teachings of the Holy Bible and centred around the values of care, charity, and compassion. <clears throat> if only so, it was like my, that, right? <laughs> my, my mind boggles, yeah. <laughs> but also, not any church is sad if someone leaves them. Like, if you're going on to, like, another church, for example, if you move house, they're not sad if someone leaves them. They encourage them and like, we hope you get on all right and we'll okay. miss you, but all the best yeah, in whatever you choose next. Like, that's bullshit. <laughs> like all of the, it is, to be honest. The letter I, from Peter and Brian that I referred to a few minutes ago, that was in reply to a letter I'd written to them, which was protesting about 
my wife getting a legal legal separation, going for division of assets, which I protested vigorously against every step of the way. Doesn't seem to be any way I can stop it. And some factors, as far as I'm concerned, she's got no moral or scriptural basis to separate from me, even, even if there had been a right basis for my withdrawal, which I don't think there is. About 40 years ago, I think in the 80s, the government in New Zealand was planning to um, change the law to remove adultery as a basis for divorce. And at the time, I, I clearly recall the Brethren lobbying. I think they were in contact with every member of parliament uh, with leave adultery as a basis for divorce because it was the only scriptural basis. Now, um, Brethren are quite happy to overlook what it says in the Bible and, and um, force husbands and wives to separate just because one party refuses to bow down and, and worship their, um, you know, yeah. their supposed leader. Um, so I don't know whether the Lord, the Lord must have done a, like a full U-turn, not just turned a corner. <laughs> that one, um, I've written to several brethren asking them to clarify what the brethren believe. You know, do they believe the Bible or not? And, but I've never had any reply to that. And about 18 months ago, I made a, an unconditional written commitment before God to my wife and family to provide generously for her uh, as long as I'm una as as long as I'm able to. So for a Christian man to to put a, a written committal before God signed, um, that's not acceptable apparently if the man's regarded as an opposer. And so she's refused to accept it. She's using very expensive lawyers, um, including a King's Council, which I've got to pay for. Wow. So I'm paying for lawyers to screw me. Her and the family are still beneficiaries of my will, and I'm not wanting to be unreasonable. I'm not trying to be a skin flinder or anything else. I, I, I'm quite happy for her to, to take, you know, to, to provide for her needs. But uh, I, the business needs money to function um, and if i've got to give it all to to her the, the business simply can't survive you know so it, it just makes no sense i'm not blaming my wife at all for that for any of this it's it, she's obviously being told what to do and say and from bruce um you know i hold him uh, responsible not her peter bishop actually came around to my house about a year ago <clears throat> He had told me that he he had some positive suggestions to make about the the separation and the division of the assets and so on. Um, I seriously didn't want to see him, <clears throat> but he he insisted on coming. And this positive message that he was carrying to me was that we're gonna we're gonna use um, every legal means possible to get every cent we can from you. So instead of fighting it, why don't you just accept that it's going to happen and, and hand over two thirds without a fight, including two thirds of the business value and, and the building and, and everything. He said two or three times, referring to the, the court action, if, if I did resist, he said, it'll get ugly. And I asked him several times, where do Christian principles come into this? Mm. And he, he replied, we're not going by Christian principles. We're going by the law. Uh -huh. <laughs> is that their two I, separate I, I, things? I'd just like everybody to to stop and think about this. This is this is a Christian the organization, not just any Christian organization. This is the ultimate Christian organization, the the, the best in the world, uh, saying it's going to be ugly. We're going to take you to court if you don't hand over this money. And we're not even we're not going by Christian pr principles. We're going by the law. So they've they've given up. They're not even bothering to try and and pretend that they're that they're um, acting according to Christian principles anymore. Uh, what a despicable thing to say! I pick my jaw up off the ground. Um, Dicks to me. Those are not two separate <laughs> things. Christianity is the embodiment. Uh, like you are, you are walking it. You are it. It is. It's not something you just take out of you and put it over to the side and be like, okay, I got to be the law right now. No, no 
And that's what's wrong with this cult. Uh. That is exactly what is wrong with this cult is they have, they take this personification of what they believe Christianity to be and they don't become it. They are just, it's just a Uh. mask they put on. It's clothing that they put on and take off whenever they want. Yeah, exactly. I came away from that and I thought, you know, then it's it's not even a Peter Bishop is he's he's high up in the in the whole you know in the hierarchy and everything else and and this is the way he's close to Bruce Hales and everything else and this is the way he's prepared to speak I, I don't know if he was told what to say or, or what but it's certainly it's, this is what they're doing and so Christian principles just completely go out the window they're not even taken into consideration I mean they're prepared to spend anything to do anything to defend the testimony which and by testimony that means bruce Howes and his cronies you know to destroy lives destroy marriages ruin people financially pe- drive people even to suicide the apostle paul used his authority for building up not for overthrowing these guys are using their authority for for crushing and destroying not for building up i don't know if it's good to refer to it but guys like putin in Russia, he, he can't face any opposition. So all his opposers end up in jail, or they fall out of windows, or or their aircraft sort of mysteriously crash. You know, it's the same character of thing. Unfortunately, that you know anybody that's regarded that doesn't submit, just stuff happens to them. You know. So I'd I'd like to to challenge or appeal perhaps to everyone that's still in the brethren who might be watching this, if you put a man like Peresi that I referred to at the start of this podcast over on one side, and then you put Bruce Hales and a lot of his, the other so-called leading brothers around the world on the other side, and then you are asked to judge which side, which is more like the Christ that you read about in the, in the, in the Gospels or in Isaiah 53, say, which side would you choose seriously? So on one side, you've got a, a penniless, humble man who's spent his entire life and everything he had on helping others to find this, find a saviour. On the other side, you've got rich men living in luxury and, and crushing anyone that Bruce regards as a threat. So who are you pinning your faith on? <clears throat> There's no, no doubt that God's got his men in the world that, that he is uh, pleased with and working with. Um, But where are they? So if you're looking for a a successful man with lots of natural talent, well, I suggest that you read Isaiah 53 again, which we all know. Um, He hath no form nor lordliness when we see him. There is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and left alone of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their faces, despised, and we esteemed him not. Is that a scripture about the Lord, yeah? It's prophetic about the Lord, yeah. Okay. But uh, despised, left alone of men... Man of sorrows, one who, from whom men hide their faces. It, that's the character of man that we should be looking up to, you know. But the, the devil's, it seems to me the devil's just, he succeeded in deceiving th- thousands of brethren to go after a, a natural man, um, intelligent, smart, but... Go and study the Bible. Ask God to open your eyes so you can see clearly where he is and where he isn't. And and get back to basic truths. Make a stand. Maybe you'll be persecuted for it, but that's Jesus said we you know, we should exp- expect to be persecuted. I'm not despondent, I'm not bitter. I, I didn't come onto the this podcast to try and get even or take anyone down or anything uh, the only reason i've done it is because I, I just really love to see the brethren delivered from the um, bondage that they're under and, and from a web that's really been woven around them from myself i i've i regard jesus as my best friend 
and I've got far more peace now and joy than I had while I was in the Brethren. I just I lived by myself, but I I keep busy. I try to keep keep active, um, and many others have suffered far far more than I have. I I really admire courage of many others that have been on this podcast, like Cheryl and Carmen and Richard and, and Abby, many others. But I'm settled in my faith that God has got his hand over it all and, and everything will be brought into the light one day. And But when it, when it does, there's going to be like so much remorse. People are just going to be so ashamed of what they've done. I think it says somewhere in the Bible about asking mountains to fall on them. And, you know, perhaps um, for some, the remorse and the regrets might remain with them throughout eternity, which is pretty sobering thought. Anyone that's found, suffered and found peace and relief through Jesus, I'm sure they'll enjoy the, the sense of love and blessing throughout eternity, and that's what I'm holding on to. So that really, that's about all I've got to say, Cheryl. <laughs> You've given them inside a lot to think about, um, especially with your last podcast you did and then this one. This one really touches yeah. home to the heart of it all, right? It really does. This is the one yeah. that is making yeah. that plea out to like, it's in black and white, especially with, you know, the comparison between Bruce and Parisi. That's such is such a stark example of what, Christianity is and what Christianity is not. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm sure there's there's thousands of, bre of brethren who are actually genuine, genuinely want to do what's right. I agree, and, yeah. And they, their senses have just been, they've been dulled off um, by the continual teaching and so on. And what I'd love to do is to just give them a fresh like a basis to have a fresh look and at, at, at what true Christianity looks like mm -hmm. and then compare it to what what they're under at the moment and say, well, hang on, no, it doesn't make sense. You know, and, and then not, not everyone's going to be able to make a stand, you know, and then anyone that does make a stand, well, there's, there's going to be a, a risk that, that they might get into trouble or, you know, Whatever, but eventually, the, what I'm, what I've been praying for, I guess myself, is that, is that there'll be a, a groundswell of reaction enough, sufficient, that, that the brethren say, "Hang on, let's let's stop and and just have a have a review of all of of this where we are, you know, the whole UBT system, the 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 RRT system, which the Bible's very clear about um, about charity, how you the Lord speaks very scathingly about persons that go around with with a trumpet, sort of saying how when they give charity, RRT sort of prom promoting themselves all the time for whenever they do anything. Well, that's to me that's going completely against what the Lord says about how you should give, how you should act when you when you're doing charitable work. Um, for example, you know, so just. Look at look at all this, but I'd love for the brethren generally to be able to get to see this or or read it at least or listen to it somehow, just to 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 give them the um the courage to look. Well, hang on, um maybe maybe we are being deceived. Mm -hmm. That's where it's where my motive <laughs> motivation, if you like. One of the questions I want to ask you is. What would you say to your children that are still inside there? Well, I, I wrote to them a while ago and, um, to set out to set out my own position and based on scripture. Like any time I've written to anyone, to my family or to the brothers or whatever, I've I've always referred to scriptures, not to ministry or, or just personal experiences or anything else. I've always said this is the scripture. Um, and so I wrote to my family and the children and so on. I set out where I stood, based it on scripture, and and appealed to them. And and um, I, I got a reply from them 
one one replied on behalf of all of them. But basically, you said that they were committed to Mr. Hales, um, <laughs> and I, I replied again. And I said, "Look, I, I'm committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, as revealed in the in the in the Scriptures. I I can't put my trust in a man." My response is that uh, I'd go back to what Peresi said to me: "Never let any man come between you and Christ." Yeah, um, I think that's what's happened, and I think that's really that that what's un underlies the um, way the position is has now become. Mm -hmm. um, it's because they, they've allowed a man to come between them and Christ. Um, so. Really, that's that's all. Um, and I, I just I pray all the time that that um, my family that their eyes will be open, their heart will be open, that God will just sort of reveal to them. Yeah, I don't want them to to come to the point where where that they'll they'll just be full of remorse when it when it finally yeah. does all yeah. fall apart. Well, thank you so much, Steve. You have put a lot of time and effort into both these podcasts, and I am sure they are going to reach people far and wide. Um, we have many options for those insiders to listen to these now. So they are definitely Good. watched from okay. inside. <laughs> okay. I hope that your message is received well. And I know that those people that have one foot in, one foot out, definitely will hear this. And I guess I just okay. add to your plea that I hope that they can sit down and again, choose between one side or the other, yes. right? You laid it out very well. Yes. Yeah. So thank you so yes. much. And thank you, Abby, for joining us. Okay. Oh, no worries. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thanks, Abby. Uh, take care, everyone. And until next yeah. time, much love to you all. Bye-bye. If you're in a high demand religious group and need help, please go to oliveleaf.network. To share your story or be a guest on the show, email info.getalife at proton.me. Check out www.get-a-life.net for Get A Life merchandise, books, and ways to support or get support. Please remember to like this video, Subscribe to get a life and comment.